Singing has changed more in the last 100 years than it changed for centuries before that, and we can hear how much it's changed thanks to records made as far back as 1889. When we go further back than that, we have to become detectives, interpreting clues from what was written about singing. It's from doing that that I've concluded that while singing style changed pretty much from generation to generation, the technique didn't fundamentally alter until the 20th century. There are many reasons for why it changed then. Of course, the invention of the microphone and recording technology. There are also cultural changes and musical changes. We can go into all of that in a future episode. But for now, let's focus on the how rather than the why. We're so lucky to be able to hear these phantoms of the opera, the disembodied voices of the dead, speaking to us from across the centuries. The first time I heard an old record, I was amazed. I'd never heard anything like it. And my first thought was, how can I sound like that? And that's what I've been working on ever since. So, if you thought you knew what opera sounded like, prepare to think again. Some people will say that opera sounds better today. Some people will say it sounded better in the past. My point is that there is a difference. When we learn about history, we don't want to try and recreate the past because we can never go back. But we can take the best bits of the past and the best bits of the present and try to make perfect future. So let's get started. I've identified six technical differences I think you'll be able to hear straight off. Let's listen. Vibrato. Vibrato means the fluctuation of pitch on one note, so instead of a straight tone, you'll hear. This sound we really associate with opera today. When you think of opera, you usually imagine a much more exaggerated vibrato than what I just demonstrated for you. Something more like this. However, when you listen to an old record, you'll notice that you don't really notice a vibrato much at all. It's a lot more subtle. It's more like just a shimmer in the voice. Agility. When I talk about agility, I mean the ability to be able to move quickly from one note to another, especially when we're talking about wide leaps between notes that are very far apart, or notes that are close together but moving very quickly, which we call a roulade. The kind of music that requires a lot of agility is these days usually reserved for those people who have a natural talent or affinity for it and they're called coloratura singers. Um, In a future episode, I'll discuss that interesting modern term. But for now, let's listen to a singer who is not classed as coloratura soprano, but she does sing a lot of roles that require agility. Before the 20th century, all singers were expected to be able to sing this kind of music to some degree. There was a standard of agility. They didn't just rely on talent alone, but worked to add skill to that. Here is a 19th century singer who also was not classed as a coloratura. She was in her 60s when she recorded this, but she still had amazing control. Didn't that sound 
so easy. This brings me on to my next point, effort. I think modern audiences find it really thrilling when they can see and hear a singer really giving it their all. It is a really hard and physical activity singing in opera and it's exciting when you see such a committed performance. It seems really passionate. Personally, I find it even more impressive when I witness somebody doing something almost incredible with apparent effortlessness. You know they've worked for hours to be able to do it, but you can't see any of that hard work in their performance. I think that this was preferred in the past. Here is the Royal Ballet Mistress reading a quote from a 19th century dancer. I want to read you this lovely quote of Enrico Cicchetti. Aim at softness and ease in your performance of a dance. Endeavour that all shall be harmonious. However hard you work at your lessons or at rehearsals, let none of this effort be visible in your performance. There must be no sign of concentration, exertion or tension. All must be free and natural, for the true art is that which conceals the labour that produced it. Now let's hear the modern style. And here is a 19th century singer who had to retire young because of his ill health, although this was recorded shortly before his death. It still sounds as easy as a walk in the park. <laughs> We don't really have the vocabulary to talk about how singing sounds. So traditionally, we've borrowed from the painters. We talk about the colour of a voice, the shade, whether it's light or dark. Most of the operatic voices you hear today tend towards the dark sound. It has a kind of yawning quality to it. It's very mellow and rich. Historically, the default was a much brighter tone, more like the ringing of a bell, which can carry a long way. We just heard a mezzo-soprano singing, now we're going to hear a contralto, which is one voice type deeper. In fact, she's transposed this piece down, but still, her voice sounds brighter than the modern mezzos. 
I was just talking about painting terminology. One of the terms traditionally borrowed by singers is chiaroscuro, which is an Italian word meaning clear and obscure. It describes a painting technique of using the contrast between light and shade to bring depth and life and drama into a painting. It can be used the same way when talking about singing. Today, with the emphasis being placed on the dark, mellow sounds, such as we just heard, there isn't always a lot of contrast with the brighter tones, and that can leave us with the impression of it being a bit 2D, all a bit one shade, one colour, one tone. guessed it, in the past singers used to try and vary the colour and shade as much as possible. They would also vary the weight of the voice. The registers were not so uniform so the high and low notes had a lot more contrast and they changed the volume as much as possible all to bring drama to the music. <laughs> Finally, legato. Legato is actually a difficult concept to describe or to grasp, but you'll know it when you've heard it, and then you'll always demand it. What we're listening out for is the notes leading fluently into one another. To do this, we have to sing the line, not the notes. When you don't do that, it can sound a little bit like a tape being played backwards. In fact, if I play this backwards, you'll get an idea of the effect. Okay, so it's not quite as bad as that in the following clip, but I think you can hear what I mean.
Some people would say that legato is the most essential part of the old way of singing. It's such an important and a subtle topic that I'll do an entire episode on it in the future, and there I'll describe some methods for learning and teaching it. But you couldn't really ask for a better teacher than a perfect example of legato singing, and that's what we're going to finish off with today. I hope that was all clear. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will try to answer either directly or in a future episode. Thank you so much for joining me on this adventure. It's so exciting for me to get to share my research with you. Next, I'm going to start a series about singers who worked with the composers, sometimes with the composers accompanying them on the record and sometimes the composers singing themselves. If you think that sounds as fascinating as I do, then tap the subscribe button below and the notifications so that you'll be updated as soon as a new video is uploaded. That's all for now. Stay tuned for the next seance with the Phantoms of the Opera.